All right. You guys having a good week? <laughs> you guys that are on the fast are like, yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> my, uh, my family, we got to go out of town and go skiing the last couple of days. Oh, yeah, let's release the kids. Sorry. We w- we'll keep the kids in for the prayer time. That's why we're doing that because, again, this is who we are as a family. It's kind of a, a fun thing to do, something to switch it up. But the kids are headed out. And you're going with that crazy lady in the striped sweater. So <laughs> We went skiing over the last couple of days. And, uh, and there's a great ski resort about 40 miles or 50. Well, it's 40 minutes, but when you're going 80, I guess it's farther than that. But uh, so past Vegas and up behind the, the mountain on the way to Area 51. It's kind of a fun place to be, right? Um, but uh, so you're up at eight, eight and a half thousand feet. So we, Riley, Kate, uh, Aiden, and Stephanie and and I'm the only one that came back uninjured, so figure that out. Maybe, maybe being a vegan isn't that great, but um, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, but we're super blessed today. Dan's going to be preaching. Come on up here, buddy. Oops, you dropped something. I'll get that for you. Come over here and get set up. So anyway, thank you, Dan. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, I got a response. That's exciting. Ooh. I heard an attempt at an Australian accent there. It's quite comical. <laughs> Speaking of which, I think last time Ron mentioned me, he uh, said that nobody could understand what I was saying. So I just have to thank you all, even though you don't understand what I'm saying right now, for faking it <laughs> and responding to me as though you do understand. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of which, as well, being Australian, and uh, I, I make cracks about things that I don't understand about your culture, including peanut butter. You put it on everything. I don't understand it. Uh, but thanks to the Davis family, they found a wonderful Christmas present for me that I thought I'd just share with you. Apparently, this is going to make me more American or something like that. For those of you who don't know, extra nutty. I don't know if they're describing the peanut butter or me. Probably both. But uh, thank you for that. I thought I'd uh, show, show that off this morning. Something like that. Uh, so yeah, we're, all, we're all in a fast where I think we're quite aware of that at the moment. If you haven't been listening, shame on you <laughs> for the last, what are we, 40 minutes. Uh, but it kind of it gave me the question of, you know, obviously, what is a fast? Why do we fast? When do we fast? Who fasts? All this kind of stuff. And, and the good questions. I thought so. So I delved into uh, some study this week as to kind of just sorting that out. Um, if, we, if we want to talk about what a fast is, I think that's kind of somewhat obvious for us. Go without food, giving up something. Hey, if you want to define it, for those of you who like that, the definition is an abstinence from food or a limiting of one's food, especially when voluntary, and as a religious observance. So... Uh, We've got that. That's, that's kind of an easy answer. That was like, yeah, cool, five minutes done. Woo-hoo. Uh, but obviously, you know, there's something that separates what we're doing in fasting now to what happens in the world because people fast in the world for various different reasons. If you work in the medical profession, you'll be quite aware, or if you've had any kind of medical procedure, that they ask you to fast for certain things. Uh, I had to do this once when I was living in the UK. I broke my arm. Very sad. I have a scar on my arm to prove it. You can probably see it. There's a nice little scar down there. Uh, but it's kind of a funny story because it happened at night time, so I had to go down to the ER, and we sat there all night waiting for the doctor to see me. It's a very fun thing to do. My arm was kind of like bent over. It was a very interesting thing to see. Uh, they tried to put it back in place as well. That was interesting. They gave me like, some gas, and then a nurse grabbed my arm, and another one grabbed the other arm, and they were just trying to pull it to see if they could get the bone back in place. It didn't work. But they uh, told me I was doing a very good job while I was sitting there while they were pulling my arm. It's very patronizing. (laughs) Like, shut up. Uh, But anyway, we're over that now. But we were sitting there. And so they ended up doing surgery, which is why I have the scar, to uh, cut me open, put the bone back in place. There's a nice screw in there now to hold it. And so if I hit you with this arm, you'll probably get more hurt than I will now or something than that. Uh, But because they did surgery... They needed me to not have eaten food, which is quite easy when you go there overnight because you don't normally eat food. But the problem was they never told me this, so I didn't know. So it kind of got to six in the morning, and they tried to put my arm back in place. And the friend that I had with me, 
he had a bag of chips. And he had offered her, and was like, well, I'm kind of getting hungry now. It's getting morning, kind of breathless. Let's see that. So we're eating this you know, bags of chips, and a nurse comes in and is like, did you just eat? I was like, yeah. I was like, yeah, you weren't meant to do that. We have to kind of delay your uh, surgery now because of that. Like, it was, I was meant to go in three hours, and it was like six hours, but whatever. But the story that got up to the ward, because we weren't up there yet, I had a bag of frozen peas that I had on my arm to try and put some ice in it. So the story that the nurses all heard was that I got so ravenously hungry sitting in there that I started eating frozen peas. <laughs> so they got off the water like, are you the guy that ate the frozen peas? I'm like, no, <laughs> chips. But anyway, uh, that's not the fasting we're talking about this morning. Thankfully, the uh, one that you break with frozen peas, if you want to do that, go for your life. But I don't know what it's like, never done it. Uh, but... We, we, we're kind of talking about spiritual past, fasting. So obviously we've got this, this physical aspect of it where we're giving up food, something that our bodies need. Uh, it takes discipline. It's not comfortable. Uh, if you ever do a full fast, I've never actually done one, um, but it, it's not easy. It, it takes discipline. And all of this for the sake of seeking after something spiritual instead of physical. And that's where the differentiation comes between the medical fast and all those kind of things and what we're actually doing now. We're, we're seeking God through this time. And it, it, it's interesting. We'll get into it, uh, what kind of happens with that. But growing up, I don't ever really remember anybody talking about fasting. Somebody may have, and I may have not listened, which is another story. So if any of you who are sitting here this morning, and I'm taking note of who is here, come to me in like 10 years and say, why hasn't anybody spoken about fasting? I'll be like, hey, you weren't listening, so uh, you better, better take note. Or you didn't understand, that's probably even the uh, more accurate response. <laughs> but the times that uh, I did hear about fasting, most of it was related to uh, do this so you can get something. If you want something really bad, then fast. And it was like, is it, this is magical list or something like that that I'm unaware of. Is this like an 11th commandment that, that the holy people know? It's like, if you want this, you can pray. But if you want this, then you have to pray and fast. It's like, if you want a Ford, you have to pray. But if you want a Chevy, you better start fasting. If you want a Jeep, though, I think that's where God reserves judgment for those people, the Jeeps of the world. But... uh. And it was just it's just kind of this, this funny thing of going, so so what what is this fasting thing going like if I if I want this extra stuff, it's like levels that you kind of go up, you're like, oh you're at this prayer level, so you have access to these prizes, and if you're at this level now you've got access to this. Uh, it just seems really bizarre if that's kind of the way you approach it. And, and it makes us kind of seem we can get into this place where we can just manipulate God to doing whatever we want, we, what, what we want him to do. But that's not what prayer and fasting is about. It's not this checkbox that you can tick and say, oh, well, I've got my list here and I'll pass and now God has to give me all these things. Because if that's the goal we serve, then he's like just Father Christmas, I guess. But uh, that's not the God we serve. So... Getting to the Bible, which is probably a good place to go when you want to find out about these kind of things. Uh, I had a few questions that I was trying to answer. Let's see how well you guys know. Does God command us to fast? Ooh, that was one of the questions. When, when, the, other, the other question, all of you like, I'm too afraid to answer. What if I get it wrong? Uh, the other question I had was, like, when, when's the first time fasting is actually mentioned in the Bible? And it's like, mm, that's a good question. I, I didn't know before this week either. So uh, this is where I've delved into, and it means we're going to go on a bit of a history lesson into the Old Testament, which is an interesting thing to go to because there are some crazy, mad stories that happened in the Old Testament that we don't hear a lot about that you go, okay, we probably live in better days than what they did back then from what happened. But So we're going to do that. I did a bit of study of history. How many of you like history? Wow. There's a lot of people. That was, that was unexpected. Personally, I've never studied history. At my school, they always, you got to choose your subjects to a degree, and they always had history and geography against music. And so you do history and geography, well, you do history for half a year, you do geography for half a year, or you do music for the whole year. I'm musical, so I choose music all the time, so I've never studied history, which maybe goes to say a lot about the state of our Australian history and how much we appreciate it. But anyway, 
I, I did some study this week, so we're going to get into history. So let's pray before we get into things. God, we thank you that we are able to join together this morning and able to worship you and able to hear your word. And I ask that you would speak to us all this morning, that your word would be clear, that it would go out, it would go into our hearts, God, and that you would lead us closer to you. Amen. So the first time fasting is kind of mentioned, it's not called a fast, but the first time it's actually recorded is Moses in the Ten Commandments back in Exodus. There you go. Mm, knowledge. And so you kind of get this whole story around Exodus 24, it goes for quite a while through to 34 as well. So we're going to start just in Exodus 24, um, we'll read from verse 12 to 18, but to set this up, Moses and the Israelites are all camping, camp, camping, camping by Mount Sinai, which is, became the mountain of the Lord. And so God is coming and, and speaking to them, which is kind of a really cool thing. And he caused Moses to go up to the mountain to meet with him face to face, which would kind of freak me out if that happened. Uh, but Exodus twenty four twelve to 18, it says this, The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandments I have written for their instruction. Then Moses set out with Joshua his aid, and Moses went up onto the mountain of God. He said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you, and anyone involved in dispute can go to them. Very practical. When Moses went up the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. And Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So Moses is up there. The mountain looks like it's on fire. Kind of freaky. God speaks to Moses and gives him the Ten Commandments out of this, as well as a whole heap of other instructions about how to build a tabernacle, about worship, about marriage, and all these kind of other rules that God's laying out for him. Moses comes back down the mountain after 40 days and hears the sound of a massive amount of people singing and goes down and the Israelites, while well, he's been gone for so long, they were like, we need someone else to lead us. So they make a golden calf, start worshipping that. Moses gets angry, breaks the, t- the, the Ten Commandments that God's given him. God gets even angrier and decides that he's going to kill them all. Moses intercedes on behalf of the people, which I'm sure the people were thankful for afterwards. And then that's kind of 10 chapters right there in 30 seconds. Uh, And so then Moses goes up the mountain a second time, which you read about in Exodus 34, verse 28. Well, Exodus 34, if I just pick up 28, which I will. Uh, So this is where Moses now goes back up the mountain to get to the Ten Commandments for the second time. Um, And it says, quite simply, in verse 28 of Exodus 34, Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant and Ten Commandments. So it's just kind of like the first time we hear about fasting, Moses spending 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain without eating bread and drinking water. Um, For those of you who are like, we didn't say that in the first one, Moses recaps this whole story to the Israelites before they're going to enter the promised land in Deuteronomy chapter 9. Um, And he talks about the first time he went up there in verse 9, of Deuteronomy 9, it says, When I went up on the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant the Lord had made with you, I sat in the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, ate no bread and drank no water. And then if you skip down to verse 18, he's talking about the second time that he went up the mountain and said, Then once again I fell prostrate before the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights, ate no bread and drank no water, because of all the sin you committed, doing what was evil in the Lord's sight, and so arousing his anger. So Moses remembers that he ate no food and drank no water for 40 days and 40 nights. And I don't know about you, 40 days without food is something that we can do. 40 days without water as well is something that we can't do physically. And it's this interesting thought that you get and go, Moses survived this. He's around to tell the tale afterwards. So obviously he did survive this. And you've got other people that did these kind of 40 days and 40 night fast without bread and water and they survived. And it makes you wonder that, getting into that place of the presence of God, maybe it's more sustaining than what we actually think it actually is. And, and Jesus, after he's been on his fast for 40 days in the wilderness and the devil comes to tempt him, the first thing he responds to the devil is, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that God speaks. And for somebody to be in the presence of God for 40 days and 40 nights and to survive that, you kind of go... Maybe we don't need food to survive after all if we're in God's actual presence. And this is, before you kind of go, yes, I'm going to go this and do this right now. 
If you get invited up to a mountain by God himself to stand in his presence, and by all means go and don't drink any water and don't eat any food, but until that day you probably still keep drinking water and eating food. Just don't die on my behalf, please. <laughs> but it's just this interesting thought of going, I think the presence of God is a, is a lot more powerful than we give it credit for because we don't walk into those places. We don't see those things happen because to walk into a place where the glory of God looks like a mountain on fire is not something that you readily run into. But it's a place where God is and it's a place where amazing things happen. So that's kind of the origins of fasting. Uh, where it happened, and things kind of went on from there. If you want to know about who fasted, it's anybody. It goes from individuals, as you read through uh, a lot of times when people fasted, those individuals that fasted for various reasons. And then there's also corporate fasting, which is what we're doing at the moment as well, where people call groups to fast, they call nations to fast, they call certain people to fast. So there's kind of no actual set rules here as to who should fast. You can do it yourself whenever you want. Hey, happy days. You can do it as a corporate thing. Um, if you want the, the really easy low down, do it at the beginning of the year when your pastor tells you to do it. <laughs> it's a great time to do fasting. But uh, not just the only time if you don't want to. And, and this, is, this is all new to me as well. I kind of have researched this this week because it's been like, what is actual fasting? So the next mention of fasting after Moses is actually in Judges. So we move ahead a few books. It's Judges chapter 20. If you want to read this story, I'm just going to quickly recap it and keep it a bit more PG rated. But Judges 19 and Judges 20, it's this mad story where a Levi, he's a, someone from the tribe of Levi, he was one of Israel's sons, he goes to get his concubine back after his concubine has run away, heads back to Jerusalem uh, where he lives and doesn't make it there in one night. So he stops in this city that's on the way to Jerusalem. Uh, they wait for somebody to take them into the house and this old guy comes in at the end of the day after the sunset and takes him into his house to stay for the night. Very nice of him. Some evil people decide from that town decide that they want to go around and abuse this guy. And so they go around to the house of the old guy and ask him to send out the guy so they can abuse him. They don't do that, but the guy sends out his concubine to these guys and they rape her and they abuse her all night. And she dies from this. It's like, oh my goodness, this is mad. He then takes his dead concubine back to where he lives, sends out word around Israel to say this is what happened in in this town. They all rally together and get an army to go and kill all these people that did this, the whole town. And this is where the story goes. This is where we pick it up. And this is why people fasted. It's very exciting. Don't you love history? (laughs) So... They've gone before God. They've asked God if they should attack these people as as punishment. And God says yes to them. So they go and they attack these people. By this time, the other town have rallied their own army. And so the Israelites attack them and they lose 22,000 people on the first day. They're a little bit upset by this. And so they go back and they weep for the night. And they ask God again, should we attack these people? He says, yes. They go the next day. They lose 18,000 people that day as well. They've just lost 40,000 people in one day of their army. It's not a good start, especially when God has told them to go and attack these people. So on the third day, this is where we pick it up in Judges 20, 26. And it says, then all the Israelites, the whole army went up to Bethel. And there they sat weeping before the Lord. They fasted that day until evening and presented bird offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. Uh, the first thing you'll see there is they fasted for an evening. So 40 days is not the, or 21 days is not the entirety of when you have to fast as well. It's people fast for a few days, they fast for an evening, they fast for a day, they fast for 21 days, they fast for 41 days. It's, it's all up to you and God. This is, this is between you and God as to how long you do it. Uh, but this circumstance is so annoying <laughs> because God told them to attack and yet they lost so many people. And while I hope none of you can kind of say, oh yeah, I've been through that, hopefully not, there's times in our lives when God tells us to do things and it seems like everything battles against us. And you, it makes you wonder whether you've heard from God, whether you're doing the right thing, whether this is actually what God has said. 
and maybe in those times, we need to start praying and fasting and seeking God again and saying, God, is this really what you wanted? Because if it is, it's hurting. But if you say yes, then I'll do it. And it's interesting because this is the third day they prayed and they fasted that evening. And the next day they went out and they defeated that whole town. And if you want to read it, it's, it's a gruesome retelling of the story because they chased them down. But they had victory on that day. And it's this interesting thing of going, so maybe if you know, God has told us to do something and we're not getting there, it might be time to start praying and fasting and seeking God and seeing what he wants for us as well. So that's kind of the next time that that, that fasting is uh, mentioned in the Bible. But I'm going to go through kind of a few things of when people fast. So we've got that time there where they're seeking God for a victory, obviously. But there's, there's a whole heap of reasons why people fasted. Um, I'm going to fly over a few of these because there's so many scriptures that if we were here, we'd probably be here for another three hours. Uh, but just to give you some, some uh, points of why people fasted, the first one is in repentance. And you hear this a lot as you read through the Old Testament. You've got the Israelites, the people of God, and they follow this wonderful pattern of they obey God, they're blessed. They feel like they don't need God anymore, so they disobey Him. God's anger comes against them. He scatters them. They end up all over the, the, the countryside, not together anymore. They realize that they've sinned. They pray, they fast, they repent. God brings them back together and blesses them. They realize how good things they are. They then think they don't need God. God gets angry, God scatters them, and it's this kind of repetitious behavior of going, why, God, why didn't you learn after the first time? And then I think about my own life, and I go, why didn't I learn after the first time <laughs> that God kind of said, don't do this anymore? You're like, oh, cool, sorry, God, and then you go out and do it again, and you're like, oh, yeah, so I'm really no better than these Israelites, am I? <laughs> Whoops. Um, but a lot of the times when they repented, they realized that they had sinned and they came before God. There is prayer and fasting. I'll give you some scriptures that you can read if you want to. We're not going to read through these ones. But uh, 1 Samuel 7 talks about when the Philistines had overtaken the land of Israel and were, you know, they were living under their reign and they realized that they had sinned. And so they prayed and fasted and God set them free from the, from the Philistines and, and brought them into freedom again. Another one is Nehemiah 9 which is after the Israelites have sinned again. Jerusalem's been destroyed. They've all been sent into exile into various different places, and God brings them back together. They rebuild Jerusalem. They rebuild the walls. They rebuild the temple, and they have a day where they come together and, and confess their sins. They pray and they fast, and they repent before God and say, we're sorry, help us to do better again. And they live back in Jerusalem. Another one is Daniel 9, and we see here Daniel himself does a fast where he repents on behalf of the Israelites, where he comes before God and he prays and says, God, I'm sorry for everything that I've done and I'm sorry for everything that people have done. Can you restore us, please, and take us back to the people that you called us to be? Another one is Joel 2, verse 12 to 17. And this is God speaking to Joel. Joel was a prophet and the word of the Lord comes to Joel. And so God is telling the people to repent and fast for their sins in that place. And so you see repentance is a reason why people fasted in the Old Testament. A story that you will probably all know is Jonah. This is where we see it again. And this is kind of more interesting. Uh, Jonah 3 is where I'm going to read from. Uh, but the story of Jonah, Jonah goes to the city of Nineveh. It's called a great city, but it was evil. And it's not a city that the Israelites lived in. It's a city that's kind of way off. Uh, but God calls Jonah to go and speak to them and repent. He runs away. God causes him to be swallowed by a whale, spits him up, so he has to go to Nineveh. And Jonah goes through the streets and speaks to them and tells them that God's going to destroy them unless they turn from the way their ways. And that's where we pick it up in Jonah 3, verse 1 to 10. And it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim, it to, proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth, which was just a, something they wore when they were in mourning. 
When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let the people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce, fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and not, did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. And you've got these people that, for all we know, didn't know God before this. And the message comes to them and says, turn from your way. And the king decrees for the whole nation, the whole town, to pray and fast and repent, repent before God. And God sees that. And the destruction that he was going to bring on them, he decides to not do it. And you kind of go, it's easy to get trapped in this cycle. You go, oh, I'm sorry for my sin, and you do it again, kind of like what the Israelites did. But there's something about true repentance when you, you realize that this is God that you're talking to that comes with more than just prayer of saying, I'm sorry. It comes with this moment of going, I want to seek you as well because I don't want to be stuck in this lifestyle. I don't want to face the consequences of my sin and I want to live a better way. And God responds to that, which is incredible that his mercy just extends to those people as well. And so repentance is one of the, one of the reasons people fast. Uh, in mourning is another reason why people fast. There's a, there's a couple of mentions of this. First one is when Saul... King Saul is killed in battle, him and his sons. And there's a couple of mentions. One of them is in 2 Samuel chapter 1. And this is when David learns that King Saul has passed away. And him and the men that were with him, they spend a week mourning and fasting for the king. There's uh, in the previous chapter, it's in the end of 1 Samuel, I think it's chapter 31, where people go and rescue his body from the battlefield. No, it's not actually the battle. They, anyway, there's a story there. They go get the uh, King Saul's body back because it's been taken by the Philistines. And they spend a week uh, in, in mourning and fasting for the king as well. So that's another reason why people fast in the Bible. Uh, to ask for his protection. It's another reason why people fasted in the Bible. We've got the story of Ezra. Uh, and it talks about this in Ezra 8. This situation with this is, again, the same time as Nehemiah, where Jerusalem has been destroyed. Uh, and they're coming back to rebuild the city. And so they've got to that stage, and Ezra is going to get some Levites, who were the people that served in the temple, who have been scattered all around the place. And so he goes up to gather them from wherever they are, and they end up needing to come back to Jerusalem. The road they were going to take is a road that's filled with bandits and people that were going to attack them. So they spend the time praying and fasting that God would protect them. And it's kind of funny, because if you read uh, Ezra 8, <laughs> Ezra... Ezra is, is writing this and he's talking about how he was too ashamed to go to the king and ask him for military aid because he had also gone to the king before and said, our God is a God who loves his people and protects them. And he was kind of like, if I go and now ask for military aid, it kind of says that God isn't going to protect us. So instead they spent the day praying and fasting before they went on their journey down to Jerusalem and God protected them. They got down to Jerusalem without being attacked. So that's another reason why... People fasted in the Bible. Another one is to ask God for help, which is probably one that we all like as well very much because we can use a lot of help from God in a lot of things. But the story of this is Esther. Uh, if you don't know this story, it's a, it's a small book. You can read it. About Esther 4 is when she talks about fasting. To give you a bit of backstory on this, Esther is a Jew. She's born into exile into a, another country because the Israelites have once again sinned and God has scattered them. And so Esther is caught up with a whole heap of the pretty ladies, as it says, from the, the area that she lived in. She lived around where the king lived. And they're taken into the king's harem for him to decide who he wants to be queen by whatever way he decides. And so Esther finds favor with the king, and he, she is made queen of the place where they're living in. And then another one of the king's advisors convinces the king that he should kill all the Jews because they don't follow the customs and traditions of the town. And the king is tricked into this, and so he sends out this decree that all the Jews must die. As soon as a Jew, so she's going to be killed as a part of this thing. So she's now put in this predicament of going, uh, what do I do? 
biggest problem that she faces is that there's a law in that day where if anybody comes before the king without being summoned by the king, they're put to death. Unless the king extends his golden scepter towards them and finds favor with them when he sees them in the court. I think Ron's gone, and I'm pretty thankful that he hasn't instigated this law into the church here, (laughs) because we might have some issues. Of course, Ron loves everybody, so that wouldn't be an issue. Uh, But So Esther's faced with this thing of going, I don't want my people to die, I don't want to die myself, but to do this I have to go towards the king. And so she sends out a letter to all the Jews in the land that they're in and asks them to pray and fast on her behalf that she would be protected and that she would find favor with the king. And for those of you who know the story, for those of you who don't, spoiler alert, it works, yay! Uh, Esther goes before the king. He extends his golden scepter so she doesn't get killed uh, and she tells the king of the plot to kill her people and the king goes, oh, okay, we shouldn't do this then probably. And he gets rid of the decree and the Jews are saved. And she saves a whole Jewish community because of what she did. But the people prayed and fasted because of that. It's another reason to pray and fast. Another reason, keep going, is to seek God for direction. And I'm going to read a couple of verses in this one because this is, this is cool. So this is uh, two Chronicles. 20. And so this is the time of King Jehoshaphat. He's ruling the people. And they're in a place where people around them are coming to war against them. And they don't know what to do. So this is where we pick it up in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 1 to 12. And it says this, after this, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and some of the Meunites, if you ever want to be really cool and historical, just add an I to the end of your name. And be like, yeah, we're the Hookites, woohoo! It's like, we're in the Old Testament now. Uh, So these people, they all came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom. That is from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazon Tamar. I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. And the people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him, which you probably would do if, you know, you heard that a vast army was coming against you. Okay, okay let's all gather and pray and fast to find out what we should do. Yes, I'm there. Uh, then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. O God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name, and we will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you will not allow the Israel allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. It's a cool prayer uh, that Jehoshaphat prays, and God answers them pretty much straight away. Uh, Someone gets up and gives them instruction of what they should do. But this is a response that, Jehoshaphat has, if we skip down to verse 18 and 19 of 2 Chronicles 20, and it says, Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Korathites and the Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. And I guess the thing that you see here is God responds, and their response is worship. And I think if you come to God with the attitude, as I was saying right at the beginning of, I've got my wish list and I'm going to tick off these things so I get them, you kind of have this sense of going, this is what I deserve from God. And so if God was to give you those things, it's kind of like, yeah, that's what I deserved. It's, it's, it's my right. But when you realize that you're in a position of going, it's only by God's mercy and God's grace that we can enter into his presence. And yet he would still stop and hear us. And then we'd take action on our behalf as well on top of that and protect us and guide us. 
What other response is there to do but to worship God, to lay down and say, God, thank you so much for everything that you give us. You are so amazing, so incredible. And you see this, you've got prayer and fasting that's coupled quite often together, but worship is in there as well. And what a great opportunity we have over the next couple of weeks as we go through this fast to see what God does in our life and come together and to be amazed (laughs) at the goodness of God in our lives as to what He has done, what He is doing, and to just worship Him and to say, thank you so much, God, to join together and, and whatever happens, to join together and just say, God, you are so good. And I think this is kind of highlighted in a... Daniel, when he fasts for the people, we mentioned before in Daniel 9, but he has this great line in verse 18 of Daniel 9 at the end of his prayer where he says, We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. And there's this humility that comes with seeking God, of understanding who he is, of the fact that we don't deserve to be in his presence. And yes, times are somewhat different between the Old Testament and now because of the cross. And we have such a freedom that they didn't have to be able to come before God and to be able to ask him to be able to give him our needs and requests. But to think he's still the same God that is still (laughs) as righteous and as worthy of people's praise back in those days as he is today. And he still hears our requests when we bring them before him. And he still moves on our behalf. And we approach him with such humility and say, God, I don't get maybe what's going on, but these are my needs. This is what is on my heart at the moment. Are you able to do something because I don't know what to do? I don't know how to do this. And God will respond. That's so incredible. If you actually stop and think about it, it should blow your mind every time that does this. And the other thing that goes with this is God won't always do what you ask. Because sometimes we either ask for really stupid things or the things that we're asking for, God is saying, no, that's not for you, whether it be at the right time. There's so many different circumstances. But one of these that you see is David uh, in 2 Samuel. David commits adultery, has a child, gets the father killed, and has to have a prophet come to him to tell him that he's done something wrong before he realizes it. And as a result of this, the child that they had through that, that affair, God says, I'm going to strike down with the disease and they're going to die. Which I'm so glad that God is very different these days because of the cross and extends a lot more grace because of our sin. Uh, but so, so the child gets hit with a disease and for seven days the child is sick before he passes away. And David in those seven days prays and fasts that God might change his mind. And God doesn't. The child passes away. And at the end of it, David gets up and eats and drinks again and goes on his merry way. And people ask him, why why did you fast? Why Why did you do this? And he says, while the child was still alive, I prayed and fasted because God might change his mind. But now the child is gone. God has, at what point is there a mean praying and fasting anymore? And yet David is still known as a man after God's heart through all of this. He wasn't perfect. It's it's quite obvious when you read about his life. And yet he didn't turn away from God because God didn't do what he asked of him. He still worshipped. He still followed after him. He still sought him. And there are going to be times in our life when we ask things and God doesn't do them. We might pray and we might fast and and call on God and nothing happens. And what is your response going to be in those times as well? Because our response when God does what we ask should be the same as our response when God doesn't ask because we have to trust that through all things, He is God. He's still God. He hasn't changed. He is good. Regardless of whether at the moment we think He is good or what He's doing is good, He is still God, good, and He does good. They don't change regardless of whether we like it or not, and He's still worthy of our praise. And the other thing that you know, we want to talk about is that just our attitude, our heart towards prayer and fasting. 
Because it's easy to get caught in the routine if you set it up. It's, it's a discipline. It's something that you can do whenever you want. There's many reasons as I've just gone through. So while people fasted and prayed in the, in the Bible, it's not something that we just have to do at the beginning of the year. It's something you can do by yourself. You can do it with people. You can do it with your spouse if you're married. But our hard attitude going into it is so important because the Israelites, they set up these, these times throughout the year where they would systematically fast and pray and assume that these were times that God would hear them and be happy and proud of them. But God doesn't actually do that. He says that I'm not going to listen to you because of your hard attitude behind this. And there's a couple of things that mention what God is seeking for us to come to him in prayer and fasting. And one of them is in Zechariah 7, 4 to 14. And it's talking about how the Israelites, they had set up these systematic fasts and God's saying, I'm not impressed by you <laughs> for what you're doing. Even though you're asking for all of these things, I'm not going to do it. And so it says in Zechariah 7, 4 to 14, Then the word of the Lord Almighty came to me. Ask all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? And when you were eating and drinking, were you not just feasting for yourselves? Are these not the words the Lord proclaimed through the earlier prophets when Jerusalem and its surrounding towns were at rest and prosperous and the Negev and the western foothills were settled? And the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. But they refused to pay attention. Stubbornly they turned their backs and covered their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or to the words that the Lord Almighty has sent by His Spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was very angry. When I called, they did not listen. So when they called, I would not listen, says the Lord Almighty. I scattered them with a whirlwind among the nations when they were, where they were strangers. The land they left behind them was so desolate that no one traveled through it. This is how they made the pleasant land desolate. And it's this incredible warning of going, yeah, God loves us. Salvation is open to everybody, but there's a requirement that God has of us. It doesn't just stop at that moment where we go, okay, God, yes, I confess that you are Lord and that you died for me and I believe in my heart. God requires something of us. And to come to him in prayer and fasting without following what he's asked us to do, without being obedient to his word, he says to the people, if you're not going to listen when I speak to you, why should I listen when you try and speak to me? <laughs> and it can be a slap in your face when you go, okay, yeah, there's some things that we as Christians should be doing that we probably neglect sometimes because we get so focused on ourselves and, and this world and the culture that we live in. And the things that you know, we long to see, we want to see the Holy Spirit move, we want to see God move in power, we want to see healings, we want to see, we want to see all of that. And yet, maybe God is just saying, why aren't you focusing on those, those things? Why aren't you focusing on loving people? Why aren't you focusing on being a community? Why aren't you focusing on giving and being so generous to those around you, regardless of whether you're going to get something back from them or not? And if you want to come to me and ask me your things, I want to give them to you, but do these things, show that you love me, and let me pour out my blessings on you so much more than what you can contain. And another thing that, that God says through this is found in Isaiah 58. And for those of you who don't understand Isaiah, you say it as Isaiah, and that's incorrect. It's Isaiah, according to the Australian English language. <laughs> but he says this in, in Isaiah 58, 6 to 9. Is not, is not this the kind of fasting I've chosen? to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke and to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and to not turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear and your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. And it's this thing of going, God is, God is a good God. And he wants to give on so much on us, but he wants us to give as well. It's not about getting all these things and holding them in. Salvation is not just for ourselves. It's so we can share it with people, so we can do what God has commanded us to do, so we can follow Jesus' example here on earth. 
And when we get to that stage as a church where we, we focus on other people more than us, regardless of you know, what comes against us, regardless of whether we get trodden down and beaten up because of it, if we choose to hold on to Jesus and follow him, God says that he's going to hear us, that he'll be with us. And that's so incredible. And if we get into the New Testament, we kind of spent a lot of time in the Old Testament this morning. But Jesus actually speaks about fasting as well. He's, he did his 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness after he was baptized and fasted for that period as well. And at the end, he said he was very hungry. So if you're going to do a 40 day and 40 night fast, then you'll probably be very hungry at the end of it. And that's okay. Uh, but he says this about fasting. And this is just after he's spoken about prayer in Matthew 6. He's gone through the Lord's Prayer and, and taught people how to pray. And then he goes into this section about fasting. And he says in verse 16, of 18, verse 16 to 18 of Matthew 6, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And Ron Skilling, he's called us all hypocrites over the last few weeks if you've been around. Hypocrites, the Pharisees is what he was talking about. And they loved to put on a show to show that they were fasting so people would recognize their holiness. And, and it's kind of even speculated that they went out on market days. They made sure they fasted when there was going to be a lot of people in the market so they could go out so many more people could see how amazing they were by spending all this time fasting and being so holy. And if that's our attitude, you know, we, we don't necessarily want to do what the Pharisees did, but if our, our idea of fasting is that so people will recognize how holy and amazing we are because we're so close to God and because of the amazing things we're doing, God says, if you want the recognition of people, then that's your reward and you've got it. That's all you're ever going to achieve by prayer and fasting. But if you take the time to seek me and you don't go out and blab it to the world and say how good you are because of this, God says, your Father in heaven is going to reward you. And what's that reward, you ask? I, he said that at the end of Isaiah, in that, then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and He will say, here I am. And how amazing is that? That if we are obedient to Him, if we follow God's voice, the God of heaven, the God of all creation, says, if you call, I will answer. If you cry for help, I will be there. It's like, Okay, so I could get the recognition of people, or I could get God to be with me. I don't know about how your scales balance with those kind of two options, but to have God say that He will hear you and He will be with you is so much greater than having somebody say, hey, get on you, you're so holy. And so when it comes to prayer and fasting, you know, We've, we've talked about a holy for different reasons. That by no means is an exhaustive list of why you should fast. It's not something that you kind of go, oh, I have to do from the morning and from the But God is willing to walk through us in all of these things, whether we're mourning, whether we need direction, whether we just need somebody to help us through struggles that we're facing, if we need to repent. God is there with us, whatever it is. There's this thing of going, okay, let's pray and fast. Let's call to God. Let's something for me then I'll do it individually. If it's something that affects all of us, let's join together and fast. If you're going through something, it's a great opportunity to tell us, let's stand together. Let's pray and fast together that God would do breakthrough, see breakthrough in your lives. This is what prayer and fasting is actually about. It's that we're laying down things to see God move. So what is your expectation over the next two weeks while we continue this fast? What do you need to see God do in your life? What do you want to see God do in this community? What do you want to see God do in this church? What do you want to see God do in your friends, in your family, in your neighbours, in your community, in your workplace? What are those things that you, you want to see? You want to see God move. Those are the things that we need to be focusing on in our prayer and fasting. And also focusing your life. Am I being obedient to what God's calling me to as well? Because if we don't have that foundation set right, then everything else is meaningless. So if you do pray and fast over the next couple of weeks and God speaks to you, be obedient. Tell people. If God gives you a word for people, 
Speak it out. If God gives you a word for the church, speak it out. If God asks you to pray for somebody, go and pray for them. Who knows what God might do through you through this period? It's such an incredible opportunity that we have. And if you know you want to pray and fast throughout the year as well, then do that as well. It's something that draws us closer to God, and that's you know, you kind of go, well, why didn't we just pray and fast for the whole entire year then? <laughs> you might need to eat something for one reason. But God draws us closer to Him through these signs, which is incredible. So let that be a personal journey that you walk on as well. Let it become a discipline in your life where you recognize circumstances and go, yeah, we need to pray and fast. Let's do this. We'll sit down and let's do this and walk through this and, and see what God does. Because God will move. And that's such an incredible promise and reward that He gives us. And as you know, we, we always say communion every week. And every week is such a great opportunity to remember what God has done for us and to remember how gracious He is. And that's the beginning of obedience if we realize who God is. There isn't much that He can ask of us that we can say no to because He's going to be with us through those things. So as we take communion, as we worship, let's remember who God is and then let everything else go from there.